Hello and welcome to Low Season Traveller Insider Guides. I'm Anna Morrison and this week I'm joined by Vicky. Vicky is Managing Director of McLean & Bruce, a small luxury travel business in Scotland. Focused on providing their guests with an authentic Scottish experience off the beaten track, Vicky is the ideal guest to talk about Scotland in the low seasons. So wherever you are, relax and think of wide open spaces, big blue skies and roaring fires as we take you through Scotland. Hello Vicky, welcome to Low Season Traveller Insider Guides. Um, we're going to start with a visual first, so can you please tell us where you are in Scotland and if you were to open your front door, what you can hear, what you can see and what you can smell? Absolutely, I live um, not far from Edinburgh, but we are surrounded by fields which in the summer are full of um, barley which goes into the whisky industry. We have chickens, so we can usually hear and see and smell <laughs> chickens. <laughs> They're free range, so it's quite nice. It's not a bad thing. Um, yeah, and usually uh, blue skies and lots of trees, and it's all it's all very picturesque. I'm very lu- very very lucky. That sounds lovely. And it's quite funny because actually we live we live quite near a chicken farm. Chickens are very loyal, so they don't go far. Are they? I didn't know that. My uncle's just got chickens, and they literally follow you around like ducklings. It's the cutest thing. They do. If you if you leave the door open, they will come into the house. You learn something new every day, don't you? So let's let's stick with the destination. So can you give our listeners an overview of Scotland and why they should travel to Scotland in the low seasons? Absolutely. I mean, Scotland, it's funny because low season travel in Scotland is it's just not really done much like the rest of Europe. Actually, it's just not really done. And I don't really understand why. Scotland is absolutely amazing in the winter and and the thing is that people don't come to Scotland to lie on a beach so does it really matter if the temperature is a bit cooler um and and actually the weather is is it's usually a bit wetter in the in the particularly in July and August in the summer months I think one of the best things about winter in Scotland is just, and I'll probably harp on about this quite a lot is the incredible blue skies and white crispy mornings that we get and the air is like cold champagne and it's just you know everything is just lightly dusted with frost and looks all pure and and it's just magical and and, you know tourists actually don't really get to see that that's a that's a brilliant analogy saying that it's like champagne because i went recently and i was unaware of how spectacular Scottish countryside is like it is beautiful and for charity we cycle from John O'Groats which is the furthest point in Scotland down to Land's End which is obviously down at the bottom of the country in Cornwall and we had the best weather of the entire trip in Scotland it's got this reputation hasn't it that the weather's awful but that's not necessarily the case it's really, really not the case. And, you know, I'm not just saying this because I'm in the industry. It's, it's so funny that we have this terrible reputation. And um, about two years ago, I was asked by one of the local, um, uh, it's actually a, a private castle. They said, we've got some visitors coming and they want to go up in hot air balloons. Could you help us do, arrange it? And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, I must have spoken to every hot air balloon company in the country. And most of them seem to be dotted around near Bristol, actually. And um, the answer from all of them was, no, we won't go north of the border. (laughs) And I said to this lady, what's the weather like outside your window now? And she said, oh, it's horrific. We've got these awful storms and sandbags. And I said, well, it's 22 degrees here with not (laughs) no wind and which maybe you need for hot air balloons. But, you know, beautiful blue skies. And you're telling me you won't come. And she said, no. So, we, you know, we do battle with this terrible um, misconception, which isn't really accurate at all. So they didn't change their minds? No, they absolutely were like, no, we will not, we will not come to Scotland. That's, that's insane. Um, so what are the low seasons in Scotland? And, you know, you've touched a bit on the weather, but why are they considered low seasons? I actually don't really know why they're considered low seasons. And I guess it's just it's just kind of tradition that people just, you know, in, in the UK, people went on holidays in the summer um, because of schools, because the weather in, in the UK is nicer in the summer than in the winter. So that's just when we went. And that seems to have stuck. And actually, it's, it's, it's quite ridiculous, really, because we go away from Scotland when it's at its kind of warmest. I think it's becoming a, 
a less well-known secret that Scotland in the spring is absolutely the time to come. And even March can be beautiful in Scotland. March, April and May, really. April and May are, are great months to come. So I think I think our, our low season has, has definitely shrunk to December, January and February. Which, you know, and I guess if you're if you're a tourist, they're they're looking at, you know, longer, dark, darker days and things like that. But, you know, I don't know. It's kind of part of it, isn't it? Put the fire on, cup of cocoa, whiskey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You make the most of it, don't you? And that leads me on to the next thing. I mean, with low season travel, you have to look at both sides. So let's start and look at the advantages of travelling at this time in Scotland. The advantages, I mean, the first, the first one really is that um, it's, it's a lot less crowded. Scotland, before lockdown, Scotland was, particularly Sky, was getting a, a, quite a lot of press for being over, oversubscribed. And they were talking about putting a, a tourist tax on Sky, which I think they probably still will. There's not a huge amount of um, accommodation compared to the number of people who go. And people go perhaps without booking and then they, they've got nowhere to, to stay and that's a bit of a disaster. So um, that's always one of my top tips whenever anybody says, what are your top tips? It's always whenever you're in Scotland, book before you go anywhere. Um, but definitely the crowding thing, you know, Edinburgh uh, is, is um, I think there are about four and a half million tourists come to Edinburgh each year. You know, nobody likes standing in line. Nobody likes trying to take a photograph in front so it's it just makes life easier and I think that you get you get a better conversation with the locals if you're staying in a bed and breakfast or even a hotel and you're chatting away to somebody they've got more time they're under less pressure so I think you have a better social experience as well as a better sort of tourist experience yeah I mean I've I've traveled to Edinburgh before and like you said it's massively busy and you don't actually get that authentic experience because nobody's got time to talk to you there are queues out the door So you kind of just have to keep yourself to yourself, really, just to get through the crowds and try and see the most of what you want to see whilst you're away. Just for people that don't know, can you explain what they're implementing in Sky? It's, it's really just to try and reduce the number of, of people going in the summer months. The, these are you know, the areas of, of natural beauty and people don't always behave perhaps as maybe they should in these areas. And, and you know... I think globally we're being a, a lot more considerate of our environment and being very, very much more careful of how we treat it. And this is to to sort of reduce the impact on on the natural environment as well. I mean, yeah, that's I mean, that's why we're so passionate about low season travel, because it's about spreading those tourists coming through so that we can help preserve local heritage and make sure things aren't ruined by over tourism and so yeah I mean that whole thing really fits in with our ideology and it's why we're trying to promote people going to destinations all year round because they've got so much to offer but we are destroying places whether we mean to or not. Yeah and economically I think it's far better for for the destinations as well because it spreads their um, their sort of revenue out over a longer period of time. It makes it more manageable for them physically and emotionally because it's very demanding being at full capacity for, for eight months and then having nobody, well, you know, next to nobody for, for four months. It's, 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 quite, it's hard. It's hard for people. And I think, you know, most other businesses kind of operate quite consistently around the year. But with, with tourism, it's also this sort of all or nothing. I think particularly with Scotland, it, it really doesn't need to be like that because nothing really changes that much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on the flip side, then, are there, can you think of any disadvantages to travelling during what we term the low seasons? Yeah, you really would need to have to plan it in advance because some places are closed because there isn't the demand. Um, so some uh, distilleries will close, for example. Um, they'll c- continue production, but the visitor centres will close. Um, it's a period of time that some hotels close so that their staff um, can, can take a break and their hotels can be refurbished. So you, you just need to check. And also, I suppose there are... There are we do get some not massively extreme weather conditions in Scotland, but there are there can be road closures. So it's just I think it's just you know if you're probably if you're traveling anywhere off season, it's it's really wise to um, just do your homework before you go. And I think that applies more than to, to hill walking more than any other subject. If you're going out anywhere, there are there are just some really simple precautions that you take. You always tell 
your hotel or guest house or whatever, family, friends, where you're going, what route you're taking, what time you'll be back, wear the proper clothes uh, and footwear, because people sort of go trotting up Ben Nevis in, in flip-flops and things like that. So, you know, it's, you, you've, got to, you've, got to, you've got to take the elements quite seriously in Scotland in the winter. Um, our, our mountain rescue teams are very, you know, they're very busy. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, do the right thing. Yeah, I was going to say, at least you're keeping them in a job, I suppose. So talking about preparing for your holidays, are there any festivals or events um, within these seasons that people could put into their itinerary and that you'd recommend going and visiting? Festivals and events. There's actually, if, you, if anybody's coming to Scotland and they look at the, if they're coming independently and they look at the Visit Scotland website, there are, there are a few websites, but Visit Scotland's very good for, for events and festivals. Because um, actually there are, there are, um, things happening all over Scotland all yeah all the time um, a lot of the National Trust and Historic Scotland properties I guess because of the weather we wouldn't really have any festivals but there are things like um, <clears throat> the Botanic Gardens and up near Aberfeldy and at Hopeton House there are light um, I'm not sure what you call them light things where you go through the woods and, and the trees are all lit up and it's really really magical and beautiful and there's music and that. so there's three of those that I know of uh what else do we do in the winter you've got Burns night haven't you we've got yeah we had St Andrew's night yesterday we've got Burns night uh on 25th of of January um so yeah St Andrew's night we don't really tend to do an awful lot it's it's not really sort of a big celebration Burns night is is more sort of the meeting of of Burns clubs um and and dinners having sort of dinners in the evening always plenty to do yeah so as someone who lives in scotland and you are technically an insider can you please give us your three top experiences that you would recommend in the low seasons and why top experiences uh i would there are a couple of places i would i would suggest that people go i mean i think everybody kind of heads for edinburgh and that's that's very sensible because everything in edinburgh is always edinburgh is always busy all year round I would go down to uh, a place called Wigtown, which is um, very nepotistically where I'm from. Um, and it's, it's Scotland's national book town. And it's in a really beautiful part of the world. It's a tucked away little corner. Um, and all of the shops there, apart from the co-op and the post office, pretty much are all bookshops. And um, that, that's great fun. And, and a, yeah, a really beautiful part of the world to explore. It's a very... Um, mild and damp climate it's on the gulf stream so it's, it's very beautiful there's lovely botanic gardens around there that's a great thing to do um i don't know i think just probably probably just getting out into i suppose it depends where you come from getting out into the fresh air a lot of our guests come from from china and they you know they there are parts of china where you're not allowed to stand on the grass apparently and it's like you know come here and it's just you know wide open spaces and big skies and and so getting outdoors is is really important but for the canadian guests that might not be quite the same they might want something a bit more cultural because they've got the you know the advantages of nature there yeah. Um, but yeah i think i think getting out on the hills is good well i mean the scottish countryside is actually it's unique to scotland the colors and the like you say the blue skies it's stuff that you don't actually see anywhere else i mean i was blown away by the heather and how purple the highlands are and again i've not seen that kind of array of color and beauty in a, in like somewhere else before so i think there's always something different to offer and i think yeah. now more than ever being outside is something that people really value it's really important and it gets you away from the crowds and it's also a very british yeah. thing isn't it to be so cold that when you come back indoors, that warming up is a sensation that I think all British people can relate to, but it's one that makes you feel so cosy. And I don't know about you, it makes me feel very Christmassy, uh, which given the time of year- It is, is you tingle. Absolutely, yeah. I love that feeling. Yeah. yeah, when you slightly, you kind of burn a little bit, but it's a good, yeah. it's a really nice feeling. Yeah, 100%. And you yeah, and you've earned that that sort of extra crumpet with your tea. <laughs> yeah, too right you have, yeah. All those calories burnt just trying to keep warm. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and going on to, so you've given us your top experiences. Now, can you give us some insider tips, some local, yeah, local advice? Local advice. Um, I think the the it's really important wherever you're staying to talk to the people that you're staying with, whether it's a, a guest house or a hotel or, or something. Um, because it's all, and this applies to wherever you're traveling, really. It's always the locals who know where the best place to eat is and, and what, or, or what's going on, you know, that, that maybe there's a stand-up thing happening at the comedy club or, you know, that's what, that's what people... Um, that's all you, you need to speak to the locals i think that's probably the, the, the best bit of advice with yeah. scotland you have to be pre- prepared with scotland you have to bring your, your sun cream and your umbrella and your welly boots and your bikini you have to bring everything you have to be really prepared in scotland <laughs> that's <laughs> that's a good bit of advice yeah brilliant there's all yeah always plenty happening so yeah keep your ear to the ground i think yeah yeah i mean have you got any advice for understanding scottish people because i know that i i know a lot of people that have had trouble because scots have their own language my cousins are scottish and they'll say things to me and i'll I'll just be left there going what what did you just say and they've literally made up well not made up their own words but there are there is a whole different vocabulary over there it's insane it, it is. And even though I live here and I've lived here my whole life, um, there are occasionally there are people and I can't. And it's it's the worst feeling in the world. Everybody's been there where you go, sorry, what? <laughs> and then you have to go, sorry, I still didn't catch it. And oh, it's just so it's horrible. Um, I don't know. I think most people are quite good at slowing down when they're speaking to people who um maybe aren't used to the Scottish accent but some people just don't and I don't know whether it's out of badness or not they just because <laughs> Scottish people can talk very 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 fast as well as with a very broad accent um, and I think you've just got to say you're yeah, really sorry could you slow down a little bit I think you just have to ask them yeah because really it it is a different language you've got no you've got no chance you just have to ask people <laughs> say I'm sorry I don't understand <laughs> oh, that's brilliant i love it um and then one of my final questions is are there any local delicacies or drinks which you would recommend in scotland's really really famous for food and uh, and i think again like everywhere we're becoming much more passionate about provenance and how food goes from farm to plate we've got amazing venison is something that i would definitely recommend game food particularly out of season um that's when we have pheasant shooting and grouse shooting and things like that so that's when you'll see more things like pheasant and grouse and and venison on the menu anyway but out of season we've always got good seafood all year round and then there are slightly less healthy um (laughs) foods such as iron brew which is our national drink which is like a bright orange fizzy drink which we all think is wonderful but apparently it's very sweet but we all think it's great it is unlike anything else i've ever tried i don't think it's bubble gummy but some people say it's kind of bubble gummy yeah a little um, like fizzy lucasady bubble gummy it's a bit lucasady yeah yeah, mm. yeah. maybe less healthy <laughs> but like you said great on a hangover oh great on a hangover if you have too many whiskies iron brew the, the other thing which which people do genuinely love, but actually I think I think it's more the tourists is a deep fried Mars bar. So oh, I really want to try one of those. Apparently delicious. I've never tried one. Oh well, maybe we'll have to give it a go and give it a score out of ten or something. Sure. <laughs> okay. And just before we go, is there anything else you'd like to add about Scotland in the low seasons? I think it's very difficult to explain just how beautiful Scotland is in the low season, but. You know, I think if you only come to Scotland when the weather is um, slightly warmer, uh, you're not really getting a true experience because, you know, people have this notion of Scotland, this, uh, they understand the the heritage, the history, the battles that were fought here. You know, these weren't all done on on sort of nice days in June. These were, these were done in the, in the depths of winter. Life was very, very hard. This is a, a cold and, and, um, and can be a harsh country and I think to to see the the more remote parts of Scotland out of season you see you see a much a much truer version of of that country I think it brings sort of the reality of the history and heritage of Scotland closer to you 
because we're not, you know, it's not the south of France. <laughs> yeah, and you're not pretending to be either. Oh, <laughs> oh well, that, no, that, that's fantastic and that's a really lovely way to look at it actually. I really like that. Thank you so much for doing this interview with me today, Vicky. It's been really great. And we'll catch you again later in the week as we talk about whiskey. Perfect. Take care. Thanks again to Vicky for such a fun, friendly and informative overview of Scotland. I loved her perspective that weather brings you closer to heritage. It's a perspective I hadn't considered before. Please be sure to join me later in the week as Vicky returns to discuss Scotland's well-known whisky. Remember to subscribe and share and all information mentioned in the podcast, including Maclean and Bruce, can be found on our website www.lowseasontraveller.com. Similarly, you can find us under the tag at Low Season Traveller on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you for listening and thank you for letting us inspire you.